Um, also, DNOG is, if for those who don't know, is probably the German version of Nanog, which might be a bit more uh, used, uh, used to. And I'm going to present to you today about how we added resilience to our out-of-band network. Even though uh, I'll happily take credit for everything said here, uh, most of the work has been done by my colleague Michael. I just basically came up with the concept and he then had to do all the dirty work, even though it wasn't so dirty. But let's, let's maybe get started with what an ISP network is. So usually you would say, okay, I'm a user, I connect to the internet, that's it, success. But uh, in reality, this more or less comes down to you connecting to a CPE, your wireless access point or uh, whatever is available by, by your provider. And then that CPE over various access technologies somehow connects to uh, a PE router, a provider edge router, where you are physically terminated, at least in the sense of fiber for TSL. That's, that's a whole other story. Um, and one of those PE routers uh, mostly isn't enough, so they usually have or are able to terminate 100 or so users. And so we stack more of them within a point of presence, a POP. Um, and these POPs then are interconnected uh, via a so-called IGP, uh, Interior Gateway Protocol. This could be ISIS, this could be um, uh, other protocols such as OSPF, which you've maybe uh, heard of, or even more fancy modern technologies, but it's just for, for the sake of speaking the same language uh, here in this talk. And so this IGP um, basically distinguishes itself from the EGP, which is the exterior gateway protocol, that it, it, it in itself is a uh, yeah, single failure domain. So if you somehow manage to do something stupid within that IGP, uh, your whole network goes down. And we somehow have to be resilient uh, against that. So with, with that out of the way, um, let me quickly give a quick uh, recap what it is we are doing. So Global Ways itself is a national provider in Stuttgart that's in the bottom left corner of Germany. Uh, and there we operate roughly 360k uh, kilometers of dark fiber network. Um, but we operate all over Germany and have over a thousand CPEs in the field. Within Stuttgart itself, we have 15 of those so-called POPs, uh, two additional ones in Frankfurt, one in Berlin, one in Munich. And we use uh, basically Cisco and Juniper routers to connect everything together and use OSPF as our IGP as well as some, some other protocols. And for this talk, we want to focus on basically adding resilience to our core network here. So mainly those 19 POPs, uh, the ASR9Ks, the Juniper QFXs and the MX204s. So how would you usually build such an OOB network? You would have some sort of OOB stack, sort of devices that connect the serial consoles of the routers um, and then buy a third party uplink from another ISP that hopefully, at least most of the times, won't break during the same times that you go down. So at least do your due diligence there. But when you're operating a municipal network as we are, um, the, the main advantage of building that network is that no one else is there because then you have customers. And so uh, we can't do that. Um, we have to somehow find a possibility to connect at least to another pop uh, in the small X or in, in the hope that catastrophic failure only happens within a pop, but never within the whole network. And so what we did is basically use our optical multiplexes, those are those uh, things called DWDM here, as well as optical amplifiers, the, the nice triangle behind me, um, to take a signal from the pop A and transport it over our dark fiber network towards pop B and vice versa. So in the, so far for the theory and practice, uh, this looked like, uh, like you can see here uh, on the very top, you have a very small blue box running Linux. It's a PC engine's APU2. Uh, we've been running Debian on there. Um, and then at the very bottom, you can see a very old Cisco 2509. Um, for those of you who are aware of ancient technologies, it has a 10 megabit half duplex interface running AUI. Um, so this definitely was due for an upgrade. And in between, we had a Juniper switch that was running as a, well, media converter to convert from fiber to copper because, uh, well, both the Cisco and the APU were running on, uh, on copper. So where feasible, obviously, we ordered a, uh, a uh, out-of-band circuit from another provider, or if not, then we connected to the other POPs. And um, to tie everything together, we had OpenVPN running on a virtual and redundant concentrator, also running on Debian, and um, we wouldn't be here if, if that also wouldn't be due for an upgrade. 
Our main issues with that is obviously, first and foremost, in Stuttgart, we didn't find uh, third-party carriers in most of our locations. We had three devices to manage and maintain, and those three devices conservatively draw about 100 watts of power, which is quite a lot given that they should only be there in case of catastrophic failure. Uh, and this very quickly adds up, as we'll see in the end. The main issue, though, we had is that building redundant OpenVPN is an interesting story, and having failover work, especially when you needed to, uh, at least never happened to us, even though we've tried our very best and have about 20 years of experience in running OpenVPN. Um, again, also, when, when we link over to the other POPs, we require a working EDFA, so the optical amplifier there. If this one breaks, then the network or the out-of-band network goes uh, down as well. And if somehow we manage to not only break uh, just one pop, but the entire network, the entire IGP, um, then we're shit out of luck. So um, to fix that, we, we set ourselves some, some design goals. We wanted to reduce our footprint there. We re wanted to reduce the operational toil. We wanted to reduce uh, the power draw. And we wanted especially to get rid of that VPN concentrator. We wanted to be resilient against IGP failures. And therefore, we wanted to use some sort of 3G, 4G, 5G, whatever technology to at least get some IP connectivity in that pop. It doesn't have to be fast. Serial consoles often operate at 9,600 baud. So really, uh, speed is not an issue here. And as an added bonus, we wanted to add uh, parameter security. So uh, three problems to solve, one being the hardware, second being the cellular connectivity, and third, the VPN. The solution to number three will surprise you. Um, <laughs> So uh, after scouring the markets and seeing what's available, we landed with OpenGear. Those are very nice, small devices. Uh, they have a SFP and a copper port. They have dual SIM slots uh, that allow even for failover of multiple carriers and multiple SIMs. They have four Ethernet ports, which allow also our users to just connect their laptop when they are in a pop, um, but also to add uh, other parameters such as uh, a UPS or something that is in the pop. And then they had four serial ports, and you can ex even extend that with four more serial ports using uh, USB to FTDI cables. So in total, you can manage eight devices uh, with those small, um, small things. They also have two digital I.O. ports, which we'll use for parameter security. And the best thing is they run Linux, and they actually take care of giving you full uh, CLI access and offering you persistent file system storage. So everything we do on there is even persistent across uh, yeah, system updates. So that was the hardware issue solved. Next up, we had to worry about cellular connectivity. Uh, most of our POPs are in underground train stations. And so luckily, uh, they also house some base stations of uh, 4G and 5G operators in, in Stuttgart. But sadly, our site server determined that we just couldn't go with T-Mobile, or in Deutsche Telekom, as it's called in Germany. Um, so we, we had to find a solution to have more than one mobile carrier there. And so we found wherever SIM, they even operate in, in the US, um, which basically offer you 2G up to uh, 5G SIM cards and just allows you to have one SIM for all service operators. And the SIM just has intelligence built in, I guess. I, I have no idea about how mobile networks work. Um, but it automatically selects the best carrier that is available there. You can also tweak the settings. Um, and basically, it allows us to just pop in a SIM card, select the APN and have um, cellular connectivity in all POPs, um, which is really great. Also, for us, this, this network should never be used um, because it would mean we have a catastrophic failure. However, uh, if it does break, we still want to have some data there. So it's really a balancing act on how many commitments you give on, on your data plan there. And so wherever SIM offers data pooling across all our SIMs uh, all over Germany, uh, which, quite re uh, which reduces the cost as well. It would also offer IPsec and private APN, but um, for VPN, we, we wanted to go a bit a different route, especially for the entire company. So as mentioned, we've, we have 20 years of experience with VPNs, uh, especially OpenVPN, uh, but we were never happy with it. And we were, so we were in, in the market, especially since it was too much work to maintain. WireGuard full mesh at the time obviously sounded like a a perfect opportunity for us um, with the point-to-point -point connections. We, we use the concentrator with kernel 5.6. We get great speed out of it. Not relevant here, but for, for the overall organization. And it has a quite reduced complexity compared to OpenVPN, especially when looking at ciphers. But as, as you know, key management is still a thing. Commercial support, even especially at the time when we, we did this, was not that greatly available. 
Uh, we still needed a firewall, whatever IP tables, NF tables, or the like uh, for our ACLs, and the full mesh configuration requires clever automation. So we found this tool called Tailscale. I'm not sure if you heard of it. Um, and yeah, basically we it ticked all our boxes. It builds the full mesh, it, does, it handles the key uh, rotation. The ACLs are much less pain to maintain for us because after all, we are an ISP. We're not here to uh, spend our money, our resources on running a VPN. We're here to serve our customers. And this was our, yeah, basically our, our main selling point. Obviously, yes, it costs money, but ever since we've joined Tailscale roughly two years ago, I've never had to worry about VPN ever since in the whole organization, not only with that out-of-band network. So we, we run it everywhere and we're really happy with it. Obviously, yes, relying on some cloud software is, is a factor for us, but I have never had an issue. So good, good job, everyone at Telscale. Um, the, the main issue we have is with RFC 6598. And for those of you who, who don't know, it's the 100.64 slash 10 address space uh, that Tailscale uses internally. It's actually meant for CGNet. And uh, CGNet is done by ISPs, so us. So we, we have some address conflicts here. Um, but we, we had some good conversations yesterday over dinner. I'm sure we'll, we'll find a way to work around this. Um, I personally would prefer going v6 only, but there are some challenges to solve. Also, a uh, bonus point for us, obviously, was, was the open source uh, software. So taking this and putting it all together it basically meant buying the open gear, um, installing Tailscale on it, pop in a wherever sim, and be happy. Um, we, we then have a configuration option on the open gear, which allows you to set up a watchdog that basically just pings a random IP over each interface. And whenever an, an interface goes down, um, the default route of the open gear device is magically removed. And we were wondering how to solve that with Tailscale, but uh, it just automatically fixed itself, which was really nice. So uh, good job as well. So if we look at it, uh, installing Tailscale was really easy. We just used the pre-built packages, uh, have, have a bit of bash magic that installs them. We, we don't get kernel support because those open gear devices run a three dot something kernel. But as mentioned, 9,600 baud, uh, that, that even works without uh, kernel support. Um, and then we just wrote a bit of Python code, uh, added some zero touch provisioning, and now we can easily provision uh, new of those devices. And you can see one that is currently uh, serving our pop in Berlin uh, right there. Uh, then we, we wanted to have monitoring here. Um, so we sadly had to go the SNMP route. I personally am too young for SNMP, and I'm of the uh, impression that it should slowly uh, leave us. But it is what it is. Um, and then also we had to file a bug with Open Gear because it was not RFC 3021 compliant that is using a slash 31 as transfer network, which for us ISPs is always a quite usable thing because wasting public IP addresses, giving the market price of 50 bucks an IP is actually quite painful. So Open Gear kindly enough fixed that for us uh, a while ago, so you're, you're free to use it in the future. And then, uh, Basically, what we're left with is, is this very nice Grafana dashboard you can see here. Um, especially interesting is at the very top, those green bars that show us how our doors are behaving. And uh, if you ever had remote hands in a data center and then seeing the invoice thereafter, uh, you have a very good way now to challenge them if the actual remote hands task was two hours or four hours, um, which they really don't like. But um, tough luck. Um, aside from this, we, we're able to basically monitor everything. We can see how stable or unstable LTE is, which bands are used, and uh, what, what to do next with it. And so this mainly concluded our project. Um, we, we had some lessons learned here. First and foremost, tail scale is just simply amazing. Also, the open gears just work, and wherever sim just works. So for us, it was one of those few IT projects that actually just go as planned and uh, are in time and in budget. Then the, the best lesson learned was that a fully meshed VPN is really amazing, um, especially in catastrophic IGP failure scenarios. Please don't ask me how I know, but uh, maybe, maybe I'll tell the story. So we had a... Um, we had a oopsie in our routing configuration and the whole network went dark. And this was at the time where we were still evaluating this and just had the first open gear with Tailscale in installed. Um, and yeah, we're, 
we, we had an issue. So I actually asked uh, one of our colleagues to just grab that better open gear, run into this data center and plug it into one of our core routers so we can actually do our work. And it just worked, um, which really saved our butts and uh, reduced the downtown there, because otherwise uh, we, we would have to have someone sitting in the data center for a few hours and configure everything. As mentioned, the door contacts themselves are also very amazing um, for ref verifying those remote hands builds. And then another painful lesson to learn was that if you, uh, if you have remote hands who install your out-of-band network and uh, kind of kink the, the serial cable a bit and produce a short on it, and you plug it into the routing engine of one of your core routers, uh, they don't like that. Yeah. Um, and so it crashed and caused another outage. But uh, yeah, I guess nothing to blame anyone except the remote hands for. And obviously those guys who, who thought that uh, just because there is a packet loop on a serial level, the router should crash, but hey, we, we survived. Um, and another lesson learned, and I'm going to be completely honest here, we didn't plan for it, but if we now in retrospect look at the power consumption we have here, reducing our power consumption by roughly 88.5 88 watts times 19 pops really does add up. It saves 6.2 tons of CO2 per year, and those 420 grams are still a very conservative uh, uh, measure, or metric tons to say. Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm a bit metric here, but I hope everyone's fine. Um, but, but not only it saves the environment, but it also saves quite a lot of money. In this case, roughly 7,500 euros a year, uh, which results in a hardware break even in less than, uh, less than three years. So this is also something we, we are now taking into account when reevaluating our hardware decisions. So what are next steps? Um, we have to complete a rollout. We are currently at, I think, 10 of almost 20 pops uh, rolled out. So this will, will happen in the, com uh, in the coming weeks. And we will open source the documentation on how to install TailScale and op OpenGear on our GitHub. So feel free to check that out. Uh, it's not there yet, but I'm hoping we can get this done within the next two weeks. Um, we also, because whoever here has ever done SNMP exporter knows the pain behind it. Uh, we will gladly share our config to the upstream um, SNMP exporter generator.yaml file, so you don't have to do this again if you want to implement it. And then we've also added a small console tool, and um, let me maybe hope that the demo gods are ever in my favor. Um, so I have some time to spare. Uh, uh, Yeah, give me a second. Uh, yeah. So bigger, you said. Um, so what we can now do is basically say here console.py um, and then just a device uh, whose host name I know and it in the back end is using uh, Netbox to find the device itself. Then it finds the open gear it's connected to and then prompts me for my password. And with that, uh, I am now connected via Tailscale to a router in Berlin, Germany. Um, Thank you for clapping. That was a last minute demo I just came up with. <laughs> so yeah, um, if, if anyone is interested in that, we'll happily open source it as well, as well but it's just a no, tool you write in a day to, to save some work. And with, with that out of the way, before I, I yield the floor, um, I'd like to invite you to join us for DNOC in Berlin. If, if you ever wanted to, it's, as mentioned, an, one of the biggest uh, conferences of network operators in even Europe. So feel free to come by if you want to. And with that, I'm done. Thank you so much for having me.